and that's uh, Roseanne. Roseanne Bester. I'm quite I'm quite excited to hear your talk, Roseanne. Um, and just to introduce everybody uh, to Roseanne, she's a researcher affiliated with the Institute of Water Research at Rhodes University. And she has a master's degree in economics from the University of Pretoria. And she's passionate about restoration and in particular ecological restoration. Um, and this evening she's going to talk to us about uh, restoration in South Africa and maybe perhaps a bit how we as a citizen scientist community can, can help her in her work. Um, so yeah, please Roseanne, uh, let's, let's hear uh, your talk. Right, the economics of restoration. I always ask myself how I end up talking to such excellent scientists. Um, I, I come from the humble, uh, humble economics background where uh, you never think of anything besides money. And I've, I've always find that people are a bit, um, a bit eager to dodge me when it comes to speaking to things like speaking to people who are passionate about biodiversity and all these incredible species and all these animals and plants. It's um, overwhelming for me to always be in, um, in such environments. So the economics of restoration. Right. I work for a small NGO called Acid Research. Uh, and this is our team and we are the economics of restoration team. Um, I just want to get to my passion. My passion is when a land that looks like this, and I don't understand anything about the, the vegetation or the animal life. I just, I just like it when it's restored. I mean, to me, that just looks better. I, once again, I have no um, knowledge of, of all of the plants or, or all of the processes that are going on on the right hand side there. But I am very passionate about this idea of restoration and I would like to live in a world where I get to see more of, of this kind of transition, where I get to hear more stories about it and, and just, you know, um, see this sort of salvation happening to the earth. My big issue is, um, yeah, how, how, how can we see more of these kinds of things happening around us? I am now obviously speaking to an audience that cares quite a lot about biodiversity and about um, yo, every single living creature on the earth. Um, uh, and I assume that all of you would also like to see more restoration taking place around you. Um, so here we come to the economics of restoration. This is sort of where it comes in. The idea is that we need to find a way to convince the world that if you make a short-term investment in restoration, there'll be some kind of improved ecological function and there'll be some sort of benefits derived from, from that restored area or that restored land. And then this will sort of reduce some sort of a cost-benefit ratio, um, which will cause people to be more willing to continue investing in restoration. Um, and the economics of restoration basically is just seeking to find a way to uh, convince society and policymakers that, you know, restoring land is, is an important thing. Um, safeguarding biodiversity is an important thing, and uh, we should keep doing it as a society. In order to do this, though, uh, we, need to, we need to sort of quantify and understand what are the benefits of restoration and what are the costs of restoration. Now the costs of restoration include things like like what are the transport costs or or, or what are the opportunity costs or, or, or operating costs of, of the kind of restoration project. How much does it cost to put in a couple of, of gabions? How much does it cost to put up salt fences? Um, all the labor involved with that. Uh, benefits are usually ecosystem services and their valuation. So it's things like what is the value of the mouse bird, or 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 um, what kind of what kind of um, value does it have for disease control, for instance. 
So these are the sort of, this is like the valuation side of it. Um, and you would be shocked to know how little of this information is available. It's, uh, I'm going to show you actually. So the economics of restoration is a relatively new kind of concept that's only been around for about 20 years. Um, over here, you're staring at a graph that just talks about uh, citations of, of papers that uh, on the topic of the economics of restoration. So this is peer-reviewed literature, and, and these are sort of an increasing trend in the rate at which it's being cited every year. Um, and this is globally. So more and more researchers are busy writing about, about this, this, this need we have to make an attempt to give monetary values to these wonderful things like biodiversity, all these various ecosystem goods and services that healthy land will provide for society, or even just talking about the costs. Um, in South Africa in particular, um, I have been working with my team and we have uh, been going through all of the peer-reviewed literature we can get our hands on, um, reading it, and obviously we have some um, criteria for what we include and what we exclude. But we have thus far been able to add 177 papers to our database where people have actually spoken about, reference, just spoken about, or made an attempt to give um, valuation of costs and benefits um, associated with with conservation, restoration, um, generally with, with goods and services provided by the environment. So 177 papers isn't quite a lot of data, um, but it's, it's obviously, I, I do believe that the same trend we're seeing globally where this kind of topic is becoming uh, more popular, we're also seeing happening in our country. Uh, so there are a couple of databases in the world that have tried to obviously um, consolidate all the, the information we have on the economics of restoration in South Africa, but uh, they, they typically don't have, um, they're quite small. Like for instance, you have, the big one is the TEEB database, um, and it has about 22 uh, instances where, where South Africa has been um, where you had a case study in, in, in South Africa. Uh, and we're trying to build a, a bigger database. So we're currently sitting at 177 papers, which isn't a lot. There's a, they're, they're distributed all over the country. Um, there, there isn't really much to, to go about saying, um, and it's very difficult to come up with like one of Les's maps for the economics of restoration for the various costs and benefits you can derive. We don't really have much of a distribution of, um, you know, study sites from which we can draw this data. So the benefits in, 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 in certain areas in our country, we have, we have no idea of how that's distributed. And once again, I can't, I can't with 177 papers that try to estimate costs and benefits, I can't really give you a, a good overview of what it's going to cost to restore a piece of land and what the benefits of it might be. Now, what, um, what I've come here to do is I've come here to uh, ask you whether or not it would be possible for citizen scientists to help collect and build this kind of of costs and benefits data. Uh, I do believe that we do need help. I mean, peer-reviewed literature is not that much to go on. I know there are many people um, who perhaps have the opportunity to take pictures of, of various restoration projects, to uh, perhaps even share cost information somehow. And I'm wondering if, um, I could actually engage the audience and ask, I mean, there's such a need to carry on this, this fight against degradation in our country. And I know I'm speaking out to people who are very passionate about the environment. And I'm hoping that I can, I can, I can get some ideas. It, would there be a way for us to 
um, increasing awareness with it. Is this even something that the audience would be interested in um, to help us uh, come up with an understanding in society of what the benefits of restoration could be and what their costs could be. For instance, if somebody is um, restoring a gully in an estate, would there be a way for, for that information, the cost information, or even pictures of that process over time to, to make their way um, into various, I suppose, databases that we could draw information from that anybody can access? Um, uh, there are various websites. Uh, I, I am working with a colleague and there is this one website called Restory, which is just taking in um, narrative descriptions of restoration projects from, from, from citizens on their farms, on their land, um, where they live. Um, so there are examples like that. And that is basically my talk. I am, I'm actually hoping I can get some good inputs or some ideas of how one can engage society broadly um, on the matter of collecting this information. I hope I have done some kind of a job of impressing upon you the need for it, the need to collect cost and benefit data, the need to distribute it, the need to um, arm people with that knowledge so that they can lobby for restoration projects. And I'm not just speaking about um, you know, public works working for projects in South Africa. I'm, I'm also speaking about people perhaps living uh, in suburbs and in rural areas all over the country. So that's my talk. And I, I would very much like to hear from the audience if, if there um, are perhaps any uh, ideas or, or, any, um, or any desire to, to explore something like this. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Roseanne. That was awesome. Um, my head is already like buzzing with with ideas. I almost want to be like, can I join yes. your team? <laughs> no, no, let's hear them. I'm actually, I'm, 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 I'm very grateful. Let me stop sharing. No, that was that was really fascinating. I can already think of. So, so I mean, would would you be looking for? I guess examples of where people have have implemented some sort of restoration type project wherever it might be and then maybe yes, definitely. we can upload I mean, photos somewhere along yes. with whatever they did like i guess before after stuff because i'm just be thinking um, i helped once with um we built um uh, floating islands inside yeah. this wildlife estate where they've got like their own kind of water treatment plants like a wetland system yeah um and then and then like the main dam obviously there's a bit of like um algal build up so to help with the water quality um we we built these uh floating island things just to help to help with the water quality and obviously yeah. that has benefits for all the rest of the species and the people and like cleaning the water and all of that kind of thing. So that's just one example that I can think of. No, but that's exactly it. That's that that would be incredible if we could have um, people reporting on this or um, sending photos, sending yep. just descriptions, just anything like that, um, pinned to a map somehow. If we could, if we could, if we could collect that information. I mean, these are things that one can always go back and quantify later. Yeah. Um, but just to collect the description of it, I don't want people to fall, stumble over numbers right now or money. It's yeah. just the, 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 the story, the narrative of restoring yeah. land and how important it is to, to for me at least, I don't know, I think it's important to engage no, people in this. And it's definitely, share. I mean, it's just, I mean, if you think of stuff like soil degradation and, and erosion and all that kind of thing, like um, land res restoration is definitely something important. I know, Les, don't, don't we have like space in the virtual museum <laughs> for this kind of project? <laughs> yeah, I was, that, you, you've taken the words out of my mouth. I, yeah. I, uh, I, I think we need something like restoration map or something like that where people can just upload photographs of, uh, of, of examples. And it's and have a powerful little, stuff. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and, and use the, um, the, the, the notes box 
to um, to des to describe it. So I, th I think I think it's it's all it's all there. There wouldn't be a need for an ID panel. We'll just <laughs> so it's potentially it's uh, it's it, it could could easily work. So uh, yeah, I'll speak to Rene. I think it's quite exciting. So, um, yeah. so I have, a, I, have a, I have a PhD student who um, has built a um, um, what are these ponds called that that uh, attenuate the floods, stormwater ret retention pond. So this isn't is a big... the the rain gardens, rain gardens. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so it, it isn't just a big pond. It's actually a pond which is um, full of of um, of stones. So the, it's the it's the gaps in between the stones that fill up with uh, with with water and hold the, the storm water back. So you can't fall into it, but it actually does an amazing uh, an amazing job. And she has all sorts of uh, of wildlife uh, wildlife in it. So uh, so I I have my abandoned swimming pool, which is full of uh, of. Uh, um, Dragonflies, six species of dragonflies, I think. That's hardly restoration, that's abandonment. <laughs> um, I'm just, I just saw a comment here in the chat. Um, uh, Dave Thompson says, so uh, presumably, he says like maybe existing biodiversity atlas data could feed into the estimates of some of the benefits of restoration. Yes, it can. Actually, yeah. this is very true. Thank you. That's another that's another point because um, when you have to understand where restoration is being done, though. Um, do you have do you have these maps um, that change over time? Do they change over time? Yeah. So the Bird Atlas project started in um, in two thousand and seven, mm. and it was supposed to be a a five-year project but it's um, it's turned from being a sort of a snapshot of distribution into the um, the video of bird distribution how bird distributions are changing but it's not really at a fine enough scale for um, for, for really looking at uh, restoration stuff it, um, it can can capture you know sort of large-scale sort of climate change um, effects but it's not going to pick up at, at this scale, so we actually we we, we need to um, um, develop, and I've been thinking about this for a while now. Projects which are somehow more quantitative, where you actually um, have to do some some uh, some counting of butterflies and counting of birds, um, counting of dung beetles to actually um, measure change uh, through time. So I've often thought about uh, things like uh, putting up a, a, a white cloth at night and, um, and measuring the number of moths that come and sit on it. And as, as land is restored, one would expect the number of moths that you get to, uh, to increase. And uh, some bright people have done uh, automated things like that. So you don't have to sit and watch it. It actually just... just captures the uh, photographs automatically. So that puts us sort of a bit beyond the realm of citizen science, but I think those sorts of things are incredibly expensive. Uh, um, I, see, I see Dave also asked here, um, to what extent do restoration costs need to be estimated separately for different locations? Um, uh, obviously, I think that there is actually a lot of variation uh between various locations most costs um especially if you look at public works this has to do with just the, the mechanism the machine of, of going through local government um the the cost of acquiring protective gear in one area will obviously be a lot more expensive than the cost of um, acquiring protective gear in another one so uh there's a lot of human dimensions in the human like system dynamics or, or just societal dynamics that that will cause a lot of differentiation between the costs so you have things like um road access infrastructure you have the actual uh, municipal systems there how, how well they work 
all of these things will cause there to be great variation in, in costs um, between places for actual restoration. This is just getting the, the raw materials, moving it to, I don't know, a bit of grassland somewhere and then trying to, to recede it or trying to stop, stop erosion. So all of these costs vary considerably over time. I um, don't know if, I don't know of any, um, I don't know of anyone who has tried to make sense of how these costs vary over time in different locations. And I think it would be politically too, it would be, it would be too, um, it would be dangerous to, to raise such questions if we, if we look at the distribution of costs over time. I know that, for instance, with the, with the looking for water projects, um, I know everyone knows that, that costs vary depending on how, how densely invaded an area is, obviously. Um, also, they vary with, with species that are trying to be removed. So uh, there are many factors that could cause variation in costs. And the idea is if one could at least get um, as many examples as possible of, of, of projects and costs, one can have a better estimate if it's like, you know, you can't sort of predict it. What I'm trying to say. I don't know if anyone has gone about trying to predict what the cost of restoration will be um given all of these various factors does that answer the question um yeah yeah i think so i i, I think I, mean, I think i mean we definitely the cost of not restoring what we've already damaged so much is far greater than than uh restoring <laughs> Um, yes, but you just have to convince the right people. Of yeah. it. So this is where it becomes very messy because it's, it's all these human systems and it's these interactions and, um, yeah. and money talks and benefits talk. I think most of most of the, the, the future of restoration in South Africa lies in the hands of private landowners anyway. Uh, so um, it lies in the hands of... of um, people who are really passionate about their land and enthusiastic to, to ensure its its health and beauty for, for the future. I think that's that's where the, the that's where the power of it is. Um, but I I am I'm hopeful that uh, without trying to, to pull people too much into the human dimensions of restoration and how messy that could be. Um, yeah, one can find a way to increase the amount of reporting from the public on, on matters of restoration and benefits. And that will also obviously increase awareness of these benefits and of restoration. Um, so, yes, yeah. more, more reporting of it, more thinking of it, more giving attention yeah. to it. Yeah, Les, the other thing I was also thinking, we could also get more people to write papers on it for biodiversity observations yeah like if they, if they have like, yeah if they because we've got this little e-journal biodiversity observations and if people can can you know write their stories of what they did on their property or or what they've seen done somewhere um we can yeah we can archive that in the journal and then it is there like available for people to read and Yes, yeah. and if and if one day we can make the push to also um, find a way to to report from just just reporting it would be incredible. Also, reporting the cost side would be incredible. Like how what were the challenges? How much did it cost you? How difficult was it to actually get this work done? Those kinds of things are very important to report as well. Um, it would be ideal if people could give provide cost estimates for it. And it would be ideal if they could describe benefits. Um, they don't necessarily need to, to try and give RAND values for these things, but just the description of it alone um, would, be, would be fantastic. I, I, th I think inadvertently, Ros, you've, you've touched on something which is, um, which is I think, really important to, um, to, to, to us as we do citizen science. So, um, a lot of citizen science is done actually from the from the, the people who organise the project from the, um, the eyes on matchstick perspective. So uh, so all the scientists want is is what people have seen the data, and um, but the reality is is that um, is that um, participation itself creates awareness, 
and I, I, I think um, I think you've um, you've emphasized that several times now is that just being involved is actually um, a, um, a, a mechanism for change in its in its own right and uh, and that's really really um, important stuff and and you've actually uh, I don't seem to say you touched a raw nerve but you but you you've touched something which I think is really um, important to uh, to us as an as an organisation, the BDI. Yeah, definitely. I um I can definitely see us getting involved in this. Um, there's just so yeah, tons of opportunities. Um, and Lisa, I just wanted to ask you. You um posted a link to Friends of Carbon Valley in the chat. Can you maybe just um explain a bit there? Yes, thank you, Megan. Um, I've known Krista for a number of years and she's been involved in this restoration project of the Colburn Valley for a number of years. I'm not sure exactly the details um, of what she has done, but I know she has um, involved um, school children, embassies around Pretoria. Um, so the cost is enormous um, if you take the benefits for this wetland. Um, it has been restored. It's still under a process. I think she has published um, sort of, um, I want to say, maps or something of the areas which she has cleaned and those areas that still need some cleaning. And um, also when she involves all the people um, to bring their own, uh, for example, um, garden stuff to clean, um, she involves the bird ringers as well. Um, the children can look how birds are ringed. They have a frog, a frog expert. So if it's the time of the year with our frogs, then the frog expert um, or experts are there. The children or whoever are there can have a look at the frogs as well. So the benefits of making the public aware. So I think um, Krista, if she's still the coordinator, um, that Krista could be uh, contacted um, just for an informal um, interview or something about the benefits. Thank you but very much, been, definitely. And that's a pleasure. Since she started, like I said, it's a number of years ago, um, the spotters in the area moved out. And it's safer in the area. There are less incidents, not just along the railway line, but also in the area um, of houses being burglared, for example. So the cost benefit, it's larger than just the weight that, that has been restored. That is just amazing. To think that that would be a, a benefit of a restoration project, I, I'm i yes. shocked. And wow. the awareness also that embassies are involved, um, with, it's very, very good. Um, for example, the US um, embassy has been involved in one of the wetlands cleanup projects. Yeah, this kind of goes towards what is the value, what is the benefit of awareness? Yes, it's almost a diplomatic Beautiful. value as well, yeah. not just an um, environmental value or for the public or so, it's larger than that. So there's a, a note in the chat from uh, Petra, who's in uh, Uganda. We are having projects that are monitoring recovery of biodiversity after forest re restoration, and it's looking great. So that's, uh, that's, that's um, far away, but... Um, um, Petra, I don't know if you want to actually say something about those projects. We'd be delighted if you would actually uh, talk about them. Petra. Hi. Yeah, the, the projects that we're actually running right now are focusing on butterflies and moth in several uh, forest areas. And uh, we had uh, one where we kind of just, uh, you know, analyze the data recently. And of, of course it takes long years to, to see patterns in recovery, but actually, you know, much of the forest uh, butterflies in one of our big uh, forests has uh, fairly recovered after many years of selective logging and some areas were just clear, you know, clear felled. And uh, we are just starting another one uh, monitoring some recovery in another national park, which uh, the forest also were felled several years ago, over 50 years ago. 
and uh, we should we should be working on that data very soon. Well, that's brilliant. Um, what I what I what I lament, I, I'm much too young to be this pessimistic, but I, I found that a lot of um, incredible natural scientists they don't really like talking about costs and benefits. So um, once again, it's 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 um it'll be interesting to see what it is that you monitor and how it is that you value that that uh, return of of these these wonderful beautiful butterflies. Um, but thank you very much. It's it's a beautiful decade we're entering into. And uh, I'm I'm quite hopeful that that a lot of a lot of lost things will be recovered. So thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Roseanne, for for that really awesome presentation. I think I think um, you you've definitely uh, we're gonna I think we're gonna start up a nice project for you <laughs> and get lots of people joining in. Um, I'm definitely very excited. Uh, and to see how we can how we can help you and definitely um perhaps like on the on the where people write up their stories perhaps we can make like a little guideline and just ask them that if they if they can include like you know what you mentioned about how much it costs them to do uh, their their projects or you know and, and what value they place on things and yeah you know, see if see if we can get some numbers into into some of these stories that people will share with us. We can dream, but once again, just the, just the, yeah. just the sharing of it, that is incredible. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>